electricity is magic. When you get to play with electricity, you get to be a magician, right? There's these uh, um, invisible little tiny things that you can conjure from within the, the bits, right? And then it does the thing that you want it to do, and that's a really satisfying feeling. Hello, my name is Nedra, and I'm here in the Collider studio uh, as the October Artist in Residence. I will be showing you a myriad of the tools and equipment that someone who works with electronics uses, and then I will also be giving a more in-depth demonstration of how to use this, one of my favorite tools. It's a soldering iron, uh, and a soldering iron is for melting solder um, to electronic components. And that uh, process is twofold in purpose. The first thing that it does is it mechanically bonds the things together. It connects them physically. The other purpose is that it connects them electrically. Whenever you're connecting things uh, electrically, uh, you need to make sure that you're only connecting them in the places where they ought to be connected, and you're not accidentally connecting them anywhere where they don't need to be connected. That's called a bridge, and bridges are bad in this context because it will make the things not do what you want them to do. It's the kind of skill that you need to practice in order to be good at in almost every art discipline. You have to practice your discipline in order to be good at making that kind of art. Soldering is no different. Um, so if you struggle with it at first, good, I did too, that's kind of the point, and then you will be able to be better at it. There are sundry other tools that go along with using the iron, and we'll run into those as we do a little example, and I'll point each one out as I go to use it. So I've got my iron, it's plugged in, and so it's been warming up, but if you can see the tip, and we'll show you a close-up, um, it's not uh, very shiny, the tip is dull, and we need to do the first step is called tinning the tip. The solder is, uh, used to be made out of lead. Uh, they offer solder that's still made out of lead. I like this stuff from Kester. Um, and I, when I'm not in a, a space that has lower ventilation, I use it. But the lead-free stuff like this is actually made out of tin uh, anymore. And that's why it's called tinning the tip. And to tin the tip, you just melt some solder onto the iron and then clean it off with an, another tool called a degoober. It's actually the technical term for this thing. It's a bit of, uh, looks like steel wool, but it's made out of brass. And rubbing the tin against the brass preps your tip so that you're ready to solder. If you look at the tip now, it's nice and bright. It's a little reflective. Um, and that's a good indication that you're ready to, to do some work with it. The other bit of uh, advice on the iron, if you've got one of these at home or if you're interested in getting one, uh, whenever you get one in your hand, uh, all of that metal near the front is very, very, very hot. Do not touch it. If you do it, you only do it once. <laughs> and anytime you're not using the iron, it goes back in the holder, right? That's your other safety tip. Um, because if you're out here using it like a pointer, right? Like you're pointing around with your iron, you, you could burn somebody, uh, solder your eye out or whatever. So we don't want to do that either. Sometimes soldering happens on a printed circuit board. Uh, usually when you've got like a kit or something from a manufacturer, they give you these. Um, but if you're doing it all entirely uh, on your own, you probably don't have one of those. And so you might be doing what's called point-to-point -point soldering. And that is when you would take some components like these two resistors and simply solder them just to each other from one point to the other point. When I do point-to-point -point soldering, I like to twist the leads those are these little metal bits that stick out of the component together. And so you can see they're already mechanically bonded with all that twisting. But what you don't get yet is a sure electrical connection. And that's where the solder comes into play. It'll finish furthering that mechanical bond, and it'll also make sure the electrical connection is very good. So here's that soldering process. We've still got a nice tinned tip. It's very reflective. The heat comes to the party first and touches the component. Then we bring some solder and melt it to the tip. And since the tip was already touching the components, the components were already hot enough and that solder flows into where it's warm. Then you have to remember to take the solder away first, and I did it a lot faster than I was explaining it. The solder has to leave the party before the heat leaves, otherwise you'll get your solder stuck to the component. Um, but once you've got it finished, um, the two bits are uh, inseparable. You can't tug them apart. Um, if you made a mistake, you'll have to grab a pair of wire cutters, or those are called diagonal cutters sometimes because of the shape of the blade, and snip them apart um, because the, um, the soldering is a, is a rather permanent bond, uh, especially with a twisting method. 
If you make a mistake on a circuit board, they've got these uh, little vacuums that you can use to suck some solder away from the party. It's called a solder sucker. Um, but uh, the suckers do not work well on a point-to-point -point joint. So another thing to cover in this section are some sundry tools that you might use anytime you're making some electronics. The, in addition to the iron, uh, there are other ways to bond your connections. Um, of course, the twist-on wire nuts, I don't have any of those because I don't like to use them, and so I, I don't have them to bring to show you. Um, but they're available at every uh, you know, hardware store, and they're installed in your home, most likely. They also make these lever style uh, wire nuts where the lever opens up the cavity for you to insert a wire or a component and then you can insert it and clamp the lever down on it and that makes that mechanical and electrical connection as well. Um, and I love to use these. They're from a German company called Vago um, and they're available um, in some box stores and also online. Anytime I'm doing a connection uh, that is a, of a wire that's getting reasonably large, uh, I typically go away from the soldering because uh, taking all that time to get all that heat into your wire uh, is less, um, it just takes time that I'd rather not take. And so for the super small stuff, the Wagos are too big. Um, they just get in the way. Um, but on a medium sized scale, uh, like for example, the glowing pumpkin here, um, the Wagos are uh, an ideal candidate for a project like that. Additionally, uh, if you get into electronics, you're gonna wanna invest in a decent multimeter. It's called a multimeter because it, it will measure multiple things. It'll meter multiple different ways. Um, and a decent multimeter has got a readout that you can actually see in whatever context you're working in. So if you are doing repairs in the dark, you'll need something that has a backlight. If you're not, don't worry about it. It's got leads that aren't gonna break. The absolute cheapest multimeter leads will uh, just fall apart on you after a, just a couple of uses. And so if you're gonna do a whole lot of this, you'll wanna make sure that your leads are nice. But you don't have to get the leads from the same company that makes your meter. If you like some other, somebody else's leads, you can get the leads separate. And they're all um, standardized around this banana connector. Um, so anybody's leads really should fit anybody else's meter. You'll acquaint yourself with being able to how to measure uh, voltage, resistance, um, and what's the other modes that I really use. I don't use current so much. There's also continuity. The continuity test is really crucial because the continuity test will let you know if you've got a bridge. Um, so in the continuity test mode, this is um, if the two things aren't touching, it doesn't beep. And if they are touching, it beeps. So you can have uh, your one probe on a place where you care about, and then you bring the other one in to check and see, is this connected or not? And so you, if you find a place where it beeps, it's like, oh, those two things are connected. And that helps you figure out if all of the things that are supposed to be connected are, or if something that's not supposed to be connected is by accident. Um, another tool that I use with some frequency, although it's not really an electronic specific, is a hot glue gun. The commercial way, the, the right way to insulate your uh, electronics is by using uh, different things in different contexts. But the one that's most like hot glue is called RTV. RTV is expensive and nasty chemicals and I just don't bother. So a good homemade project is doused in hot glue um, to insulate um, you from accidentally touching any of the bits that have the electricity moving through them that you don't want to, or also to mechanically bond some stuff that you want to not be electrically bonded. Um, for example, on this uh, wooden cutout cat. On the back of it, we've got a battery, a switch, and then the two little lights and a resistor. And those little lights stick through to the front, and that's the part that you care about as, as the art. Um, but the switch on the back, I haven't bonded yet. So we could come through with uh, the glue gun and just, you know, affix it to the cat that way. Um, and likewise, fill in the holes where the LEDs were recessed with that glue. And that glue is going to hold those leads in place and prevent them from accidentally shorting to each other, creating that bridge that we don't want to see. Because if the two leads connect to each other, the light will go out. And you wonder, why is my thing not working? It was working last year. In addition to the tour of tools that you might use, I can also give a brief tour of the kinds of components you might run into. 
So the first component is a resistor. Resistors let electricity through them in both directions, but they let it through not entirely. Uh, they resist <laughs> some of the flow of the electricity. They are measured in different amounts of resistance in um, units called ohms. And so the greater the ohmage, the higher the ohms, the more it resists and it will not let as much electricity through. Another component is a diode. Diodes are one-way gates. The electricity will flow through in this direction, but if you cook it up to attempt to flow through in the other direction, it will stop the electricity. It won't let it get through. Another foundational component is a capacitor. Capacitors, they hold on to electricity. And so if you give it electricity when it doesn't have any, it lets a little bit through right at first and then stops letting it through when it holds on to it. Capacitors will hold on, even really, really big capacitors, will hold on to electricity for only maybe a second. So the kinds of applications that you use it for are to smooth out signals or to separate different signaling sections of, like in amplification circuits, if you want to buffer something, you just pass it through a cap. And then the last component that I've got that's pretty foundational is a light emitting diode or an LED. And a light emitting diode is just one of these diodes that turns its excess energy into light instead of just dissipating it as heat. Uh, LEDs are very popular. They go inside of all sorts of com consumer electronics. Um, you can buy a kit of through hole LEDs to put in your own projects uh, from the internet, um, or you can find things on the side of the road that no one wants anymore, and 10 to one, it's already got LEDs inside of it that you can reclaim. This Little Tykes keyboard that I use as a keyboard um, has got at least 20 LEDs inside of it because all of these little doodads light up, and so if I didn't want to use it as a keyboard, you'd have plenty of LEDs for a project that you could snip out with a good pair of diagonal cutters and then solder into something new as long as you keep enough of that lead on the component to use it again. The modification I did on this one, I, so I went to a yard sale, right? And I found this uh, sitting there, it was like two or three bucks. And um, it runs on C batteries. I don't like to use batteries when I don't have to because um, they run down quickly and it's uh, not, uh, you know, it's inherently unsustainable as far as like, when you're done with it, you gotta throw it away. So I patched in instead a USB cable for power, so that way I could plug this into any USB uh, de device and, and power it that way instead. And then I patched in a line output instead of the speaker. So um, if I plug it in and the, um, you always gotta turn USB things around three times. It, uh, it still sounds through the speaker when there's no cord plugged in. Um, then you plug a cord in and then it uh, patches the sound out that way instead. And a modification like that is quick and easy for something like this. It's the kind of thing that anybody could, could just do. You, you keep your eyes peeled for the kinds of things that people like to throw away. And people throw all sorts of great stuff away, right? Uh, and then you can turn it into to anything your heart desires. In our next video, I'll be making some Halloween decorations out of reclaimed garbage things that you might have sitting around the house. So I look forward to doing that with you. And then also we've got the Zoom coming up later this month where you can talk to me directly. I'll have my iron out and I'll be making some more electronics with a soldering iron. So you can do some soldering at home. I can answer your questions about your iron uh, or we can talk uh, electronics otherwise. Um, look forward to seeing you there.